involved in that. Today is our final Sunday in the book of Luke until the end of summer. We're going to be jumping into Jonah next week, and then we're going to go into the, to Malachi after that. So be ready for that. That's coming in next week. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's a theme verse of Luke. And last week we looked at the Good Samaritan and that exchange between this expert in the law and Jesus. And, and there's questions for questions and answers for answers. And, and there's what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and then in the, the question that followed that, well, who then is my neighbor? And Jesus gives that familiar p- parable of the Good Samaritan. And it's a great parable just talking about moral responsibility and what love is and who our neighbor is. Uh, But this man sought to justify himself. And the reality we understand from that is we cannot self-justify. We are grace-dependent. And as believers, we love God completely and we love our neighbor as ourselves as an evidence of our faith, an overflow of our faith because of the grace that we have received. Two weeks ago, remember the disciples asked Jesus uh, to, t- to teach them how to pray, and we got the Lord's Prayer, the, the model of prayer we see there, this humbly approaching God as Father through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that, that he would go to the cross and die on our behalf and rise again in victory and r- allowing us to be children by faith. Hallowed be thy name. We're praising him. We're worshiping him. And and we're asking for his agenda to be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Thy will be done. We're asking for our needs to be met. There's a humility there of understanding that we need him to do this. Give us this day our daily bread. And for forgiveness. uh, And that we would forgive others as well. We receive that forgiveness, but but willingness to forgive those who've sinned against us. And that's the hard part for us sometimes, isn't it? And the strength to resist sin. Lead us not into temptation. And, And then Jesus goes in to share these stories just to help him understand better of the persistent neighbor who comes in the night and and knocks on the door going, I need bread because I had guests that just arrived and I need to feed them. And and the initial answer is no, but he persists and persists, and finally the neighbor opens and gives the bread because of the persistence and the audacity. He also shares with us that earthly parents, earthly fathers know how to give a good gift and how much more so does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts. Jesus is teaching them they need to be faithful in prayer and and, and Luke places this teaching on prayer actually right before today's text. And, and one of the reasons it's separated there is it, it would seem to be him and his disciples. And now we've got a, a different audience or a different crowd. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together this morning to lift our praises to you, to worship you, for you are worthy. And Father, we are so grateful We thank you that the battle belongs to you, that you are the strong one. You are the victorious one. Father, would you just meet us today where we are? You know our specific needs. You know what things are concerning us or heavy on our hearts right now. And we just commit those to you. And we ask you, God, that you would be faithful, that you would just show uh, how powerful you are and remind us to trust you. Father, we uh, ask now that you'd be in our midst and that you would work and you would use this message for your glory and for your honor. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. You can turn your Bibles to Luke 11. We'll be there in in a moment. It'll be on the screens if you don't have a Bible with you. Now, in the sports realm, I think you'd agree that there's a lot of pride in being a long term fan of a team, right? And with that line of thinking, there's also much criticism for for those uh, people that jump around, they switch their allegiance from team to team, uh, you know. Uh, How many people were quick to sort of jump on the Iowa bandwagon with this, what was her name, Caitlin somebody, right? That that caused some people to jump on, right? Uh, And and we don't have a lot of respect for these fair weather fans that just kind of float around to whoever's getting the attention. Now, I'm going to be vulnerable with you here this morning at the risk of great judgment by many of you. I must make a confession to you. Prior to the last couple of years, I was not an Iowa Hawkeye fan, okay? 
I paid little or no attention to them. But if it helps my cause, I, I, in reality, I paid no attention to any other college teams either, okay? So I just didn't. So becoming a fan of the Hawkeyes, even just kind of a latecomer for me, it was not a fair weather issue. I just didn't follow uh, college sports much. Now, on the professional team, especially in the NFL realm, I've kind of had some more interest. And, and there might be one or two reasons that would cause me to sort of shift allegiance to another team occasionally. Sometimes I'll like another team just because they beat a team I don't like. Used to be any team that beat the Patriots. I was like, yes, whoever they are, it doesn't matter. Uh, or if I hear about or read about the faith of athletes on a certain team. And there are some athletes that, you know, they just get a touchdown, they do this thing or whatever. But there's other ones that will really give you a strong testimony. And they'll talk about the greatest thing in life is Jesus Christ. You need to know him. And whenever I, that happens, I'll sort of follow that team for a while just because of that, that interest. I'll have temporary interest in the team, even when I generally dislike because of that, because of the testimony for Jesus. But it's generally short-lived and, 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 you know, temporary half-hearted. Some of us think we can sort of do this with God and with the Word even. Uh, today's text speaks of, of there being some, some quite clear sides of faith. Jesus makes it, it clear that you either are or you aren't. There's no neutrality. Look with me at verse 14 of Luke 11. It says, Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to te test him, kept seeking from him, a sign, or, uh, keep seeking from him a sign from heaven. Pretty straightforward here. Remember, in, in some of the other encounters with, with, with uh, the demonic uh, forces and, and Jesus, they, they speak to him. They acknowledge who he is. They even beg him for mercy, remember? And, and Jesus obviously encounters a man possessed by a, a demon that renders the man mute. But curiously, Luke seems to tell us that the demon was mute, which makes me wonder, did he already encounter God and lose or whatever? I don't know. Uh, but un undoubtedly, the man is rendered mute as well. So Jesus now, having the greater authority, frees the man of the demon's presence, and, and the man can now speak. And apparently normal and clear. There's no reason for us to believe that this was a partial miracle, that he kind of stuttered his words out or whatever. I'm sure that it was clear. And we can assume this really because the people marveled. That they're the evidence that this was truly a dynamic thing. This was convincing act of, of, of Jesus' power here. It's evidence of it, right? It's based upon their response. I think we can also uh, assume that this man had been mute for a long time. If it had only been a week or two, they wouldn't have been so surprised. If, you know, they could have been, you know, it's extended laryngitis or something, right? But this is clearly something that, that grabs their attention, now, I want you to consider the cultural in, uh, impact here. I, I remember uh, some time ago being in a restaurant and observing an, an elderly couple trying to communicate as they were preparing to order their meal. They both had their menus, and she had this soft, just airy voice. And she was talking and talking to him, and he had hearing aids in, and I could tell that he wasn't hearing, or at least not, maybe he's one of those, you know, selective hearing husbands, I don't know. But... The communication wasn't good, and, and, and finally, you know, she pulled his menu down and was pointing to things on the menu, and they were communicating, they got through it. But you could tell that there was frustration there in this noisy environment trying to communicate. Think about the cultural implications of being mute for this man. In, in that context, it would have been extra difficult because so many were unable to read or write. There was no option for this man likely to, to just write out things and have his family just read it because uh, so, so many of them were illiterate. Imagine the frustration. But now, suddenly he can speak and, and he's free. Just imagine it. You've got to wonder what he's saying. And, and again, the people knew it. It couldn't be faked. It, all of a sudden, this man can speak. So they marvel at this. Again, Jesus stuns people. 
Now, within this group of observers, we have apparently two subgroups. We have those with the accusations and those with the questions or the requests for more. Some accuse him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Others seek to test him. They, they are wanting more proof. They're wanting more signs. They're wanting more evidence. If you're like me, I find it hard to criticize these people because I probably would have wanted it too. Show me more, miracle man, right? Uh, and yet there's sort of a reason to be cautious here. If you remember back in Luke 10, not that long ago, verse 13, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done had been done in you in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Jesus doesn't seem to appreciate those who seek more proof. There's this, you've had enough, you've got what you need. And at some point, there's got to be faith. Remember even after the resurrection, when, when we, doubting Thomas, as we call him, in G John 20, verses uh, 28 and 29, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. But Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus is communicating about how beautiful faith is here, Right? So I believe these texts give us a caution for demanding to see more. I need more proof, God. I need more evidence. And I know that many of us do this. And there's a caution here. And the simple reality is, is that in the Word of God, you and I have all that we need. It's all here. But it's easy to go, well, Lord, you need to show me more, show me more. So you've got that group, the, the, the show me more group, but now you have those who accuse him in light of this. They're saying, you do this by the power of Beelzebul. So what's this Beelzebul ac accusation? And, and who is Beelzebul? Why do they reference him? It, it seems likely that the Hebrew culture considered Beelzebul another name for Satan. The prince of demons would work here in that case. The Ugaritic texts were discovered in 1929 by French archaeologists and this Ugaritic test is an extinct Northwest Semitic language, and they speak of Beelzebul, the prince, uh, the Baal, the prince. And then we look at, at Second Kings in the first chapter. There's four references to to the god of the Philistine city Ekron. So you got Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, Beelzebub, the the lord of the flies, and Baal, the the fly god, according to the Septuagint. So it's this god of, of dung and flies. And this was a name given really to deprecate the, the pagan gods. So mo most likely they're suggesting that, that, that Jesus is casting out demons by the power of Satan. Our Kent Hughes has this to say. He says, unbelief loves to undermine the clear evidence of God's love and power. In this case, in the form of slander, monstrous slander, the hearts of the Pharisees and scribes were so hard that they said, in essence, yes, Jesus has done a miracle, but only because he's in league with Satan, the Lord of the flies, the God of dung and carrion, decaying flesh. It was calculated blasphemy of immense perversity. Hughes' use of the word calculated here suggested that, that those who didn't accept Jesus as a Messiah had sort of worked up the nerve to boldly declare him aligned with Satan rather than God. You ever been in a situation where someone's opposing you and, and maybe you walked away from a conversation later that night you're thinking about it and going, I should have said this. And if it happens again, I'm saying this. I'm going to be ready, it, it, sort of building yourself up to her. And, and you, can, you can almost get this idea that as, as Jesus had been doing more and more ministry, somebody says, oh, uh, that I'm going to say he's doing it by the power of Beelzebul. Amazing the brazen mindset to accuse Jesus of that. Incredibly sad. David Gooding says something very intense about this. He says, God's finger was touching them. God was speaking to them. What they had just witnessed was a direct, unambiguous demonstration of the Holy Spirit. 
Now they must make life's ultimate judgment, and they were at the point of making a decision which one deliberately made would be irreversible and would make deliverance forever impossible. Reject the Holy Spirit. Call the ultimate good evil. Call truth himself a lie. And God has no further evidence left, nothing further to say. God himself is reduced to silence. Makes it sound a little scary, doesn't it? I've been witnessing to a man for years who is convinced that he's blasphemed the Holy Spirit and there's no hope for him. You see, justice says, fine, go your way in your unbelief and your evil. But Jesus, so rich in mercy, responds to their claims. Look at verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus uses simple and direct logic to explain how silly their claim is. How would a nation... Uh, stand if it goes to war against itself? How how would a family stand if it's divided and it battles against itself? How absurd to accuse Jesus of this. You see, the word is out that Jesus is healing the sick and and he's giving sight to the blind and and he's casting out demons. And these accusers had, had time to think and to work themselves up to accuse Jesus of doing this by the power of Satan. Jesus had a reputation of doing this repeatedly, and I want you to think about that. Why would Satan keep allowing Jesus to do this logically? Really, people, you think Satan is empowering me to beat him up? That's what Jesus is asking them. He's empowering me to beat him up. Imagine a a city that that is fortified by massive walls, and, and they've got enemies all around. And when battle time comes out, they open their gates and they roll out their cannons. And instead of facing them toward the enemy, they turn around and they blast back at their own fortress, knocking holes in the walls. At best, their accusation is ridiculous. Satan is not going to attack himself with his own power. And I love what Jesus does here next. This is great. We know that there were Jewish leaders who were involved in exorcisms. So Jesus presents the question, if I'm doing this by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? If casting out demons means you use Satan power to do it, then explain your own people doing it. Again, this was not unheard of in the Jewish world. Uh, I remind you back we, when we were in Acts 19, remember we had the seven sons of Sceva and they, they try to do it and they fail and they end up leaving naked and wounded, right? Totally ashamed. Clearly, this was happening in the Jewish world, and and Jesus knew it. And he's saying, listen, if you're going to question the source of my own authority, then you better question the source of your own sons, of your people. Because they're doing the same things. You don't say that about them. Are they on Satan's team also? Therefore, they will be your judges. I assure you that those who were accusing him were upset by this because he made the point so very perfectly. Back to logic, look at verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, He takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. He's saying, listen, if you're wrong about me and you're wrong about my power and and, and how I do this, then you need to understand that the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
And if you understand that this power is the power of God, then understand the kingdom of God has come upon you. Folks, this is big news for this culture. It's wonderful news. And he explains, listen, the strong and well-armed man, it's a reference to Satan here, has no problem defending his palace until somebody stronger comes and overcomes him. Jesus is plainly telling them, he's saying he's not doing anything by Satan's power, that though Satan is the strong man, Jesus is stronger. Do I have an amen? I knew I had at least one. Here he has used his power to take back this man, to set him free against the will of Satan. Now let's stop for a minute and just get practical. I don't know about you, but I think sometimes as Christians it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to feel defeated. In my estimation, sin is everywhere and sin is celebrated. It's held high. People we care about are lost and deceived and confused. And sometimes it feels like there's just so few of us. And it makes me think of Isaiah, or Elijah's complaint back in 1 Kings. He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I, even... I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. This was right after that amazing miracle on the mountaintop, by the way. But he feels defeated. He feels outnumbered, and we can get discouraged because, honestly, the enemy looks so strong and so intimidating. But here's another amen moment because we don't need to be discouraged because our God is stronger. He's stronger. It's okay. The cross looked like the ultimate defeat, but you and I know better. It led to the victory of the resurrection. There's a key verse here, and I don't want you to miss it. Look at verse 23. If you're one that writes in your Bible, underline it, make note of it. In verse 23, it says, Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. He's saying, listen, there's no division in his kingdom. There's no part-timers. You are either with him or you're not. You're with him or you're against him. There's no neutrality here. There's no neutrality with Jesus. There's no fence riders here. You don't get to just step in and go, yeah, I kind of like it, but yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, I love this whole free grace and salvation thing, yeah, but I really don't like what Scripture says. I'm not sure he's... I'm not sure about this Trinity thing. You know, I I don't know. I'm just not in all in with that. Just like Jesus' healings drew line for those who believed and didn't, think of of what happened in Capernaum with the the healings there versus Nazareth chasing him out. You've got to decide which one is it. And don't miss this. Wrong assumptions and bad theology leave no excuse. They condemn all the same. Wrong assumptions and bad theology leave no excuse. They condemn all the same. You need to know what you believe. Observe and decide, but you can't stay neutral. Uh, Neutrality is actually a choice against Christ. You're either for him or you're not. So unlike my sort of fair-weather, half-hearted interest in various sports teams, we can't do that with Jesus. That's not what we understand here. We are or we aren't. Foolishly, many think they are neutral or on the fence about Jesus. But folks, there is no such position. It doesn't exist. There's no such position. He came to the planet, this planet as a man to seek and to save the lost. In this story, it's the mute man and those who would respond to his teaching. In doing so, he declares his, his love and character, and there should be no doubt uh, about who he is for and who he is against and where he is empowered. 
And don't let confusion or others or other ideas throw you off the scent. It's very clear. And Jesus now adds something very curious here in verse 24. It says, when the un- unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Okay. <laughs> Little questions here, right? He, notice we're not told what makes the unspirit, uh, unclean spirit leave here, but Jesus makes this right, a reference right after an exorcism. So I think that's a safe assumption here. And, and notice that finding no better place to inhabit, it will return. Again, I love what Hugh said here. He said, Jesus is saying to his religious hearers, self-reformation without regeneration and the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit is fatal. We're not void creatures. It, we, we, we will be filled, right? And again, it, it's either we, we are in Christ, we accept him by, by grace, and, and, and in, in his mercy, he redeems us and fills us with the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit of God. It, it's not just enough to chase the demon out. We need to let the Spirit of God take up residence in our hearts by faith. You know, you and I can do various things to sort of clean ourselves up, to, so do some moral things. We can adjust our attitudes and our behaviors and our habits. We can make sure we clean up our language and we do sort of the right things. But see, God desire, desires for us to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit through faith in Christ. Without God's presence in our lives, the enemy can have free reign. Sin can run rampant. When it comes to faith, there is no neutrality, even partiality. There's no riding the fence here. Understand that we've been seeing in Luke that Christ is the embodiment of the kingdom of God, and he's demanding our allegiance. It's this, are you with me? Because you don't get to just ride out here in no man's land. Are you with me? Because whoever is not with me is against me. We must pick a side. Jesus was not a demon. He was not working for Satan. He was against the demons and against Satan. He was also not simply a man. He's he's beyond what we could ever dream of being. He is the stronger man who overpowers the enemy. He calls us to allegiance not, not by demanding us. It's not a hostage situation. He's showing us who he is and inviting us to follow. If you're here and you would say you are a Christian, I'd just simply say, to, to, is there a reflection of that in how you live? Does your lifestyle reflect that you're all in with Jesus? I don't want to get legalistic here, but our speech and our actions, our priorities, our thoughts reflect what's going on on the inside and, and who's winning that battle inside. Remember in Galatians 5, that, that battle between the sinful nature and the spirit, right? We've got to let the spirit lead. Think of those people, they're bouncing between the evidence Jesus provides and the teaching of prideful, misguided religious leaders. We've got to know what the truth is. Kyle Eidelman wrote a book called Not a Fan, and I want to quote a few of the things that he shared. I really like them. He said, the biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits. 
but not so close that it requires anything of them. Fans are happy to follow Jesus as long as that doesn't require any significant changes or have any negative implications. Fans want Jesus to inspire them, but Jesus wants to interfere with their lives. Fans often confuse admiration for devotion. They mistake their knowledge of Jesus for intimacy with Jesus. Fans assume that their good intentions make up for their apathetic faith. Over the years, I've made some really good excuses. I can excuse away almost anything if I try hard enough. I don't know, are you good at it? I can excuse things away in my mind and rationalize this and rationalize that. But at some point, we've got to look at ourselves and say, where am I in this? Does, does my life truly reflect that I see that Jesus is Lord of all and he is the stronger one and I'm with him and with him completely and I don't, I don't jump sides and I'm with him even when, when the blessings are, uh, just seem so many, but I'm, I'm with him even when it feels tough, even when it feels unfair, even when I want things to go different than they are now. I'm still with him because I understand that he wins, and I'm his child. I'm all in. As we've been looking through Luke, Jesus is who he says he is. And our reaction to him in this life has eternal consequences. Faulty assumptions and bad theology leave us wanting. Let him put your house in order. Let the Spirit of God just indwell your being and take over. No more trying to bounce in and out. I'm all in with you, Lord. When this life is all said and done, what will people say about you? When it comes to the subject of faith, what are they going to say? Uh, she went to church a lot. Boy, she was a fan of this and a fan of that. Or This was her real passion. Or, yeah, he was generous. Well, they go, man, I wish I had faith like that. They were just all in for Jesus. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the clarity of it. Lord, thank you that, that Jesus often spoke in parables just to help us understand. And Jesus just sometimes used the most simple of logic to, to make things clear. But Father, we just ask you to speak to each of our hearts. May your Holy Spirit just speak to us now. And Spirit, just bring to light anything in us that's sort of half-hearted. Lord, highlight those things in us that we've been sort of jumping in and out of our allegiance to Christ and kind of in when it's convenient and out when it's not. Or Lord, I pray for that individual here who's never invited you to be Savior and Lord. Lord, I pray that your spirit would just speak to that heart even now. Father, your word is clear, and Jesus just told us that we're either with him or we're not. And Father, may we be people who are all in with Jesus, and may it be clear to those around us. And Father, we just thank you that we know you are the stronger one. You are victorious. And we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.